Now looking at a COP28, a which continues in a Dubai, we're taking a look in our science segment at the call made by more than 20 countries for the tripling of world nuclear energy capacity to reach net zero emissions by 2050. A declaration endorsed by nations including the United States, Ghana, Japan, and several European uh, countries. Now joining us uh, to uh, discuss and explain the sudden resurgence of interest for uh, nuclear energy uh, is our science editor, uh, Julia Seeger. Now, Julia, nuclear, the word nuclear was almost taboo in previous COP uh, editions. Today, it appears that it could possibly be a solution. Exactly. I think I, I even want to go back. I think the, the first rejection of nuclear energy happened in 1979 after uh, the Three Mile Island incident in the United States, and then, of course, followed by the 2011 uh, earthquake in Fukushima, which led m some countries like uh, Belgium or uh, Germany to want to phase out of nuclear energy. Now, uh, we're actually seeing that some countries are going back on that decision, and one of the reasons why is that the industry is evolving. And as John Kerry said, uh, you know, it's not a miracle solution, but you can't reach net zero by 2050 if you don't have nuclear energy in the energy mix. So it's seen as a complement to renewable energies who have the problem, of course, of intermittency, so you can't always harness the sun or the wind. And because energy, electricity can't be stored, that's a huge problem. Now, another advantage of nuclear power today is, of course, it offers energy uh, independence. And this is also one of the reasons why uh, there's this comeback of nuclear power, because first, we can really feel during this COP28 that there's a push to want to move away in a, in a definite manner from coal and from fossil fuels. And second, we're in the wake of the Ukrainian war, where uh, you know, where we also had this uh, European embargo on most Russian fuels, and we had this energy crisis in Europe, which then led to the inflation that we now know, and which also pushed certain countries like Germany to have to restart their coal power stations. So uh, those are two of the reasons why, but you can really see that nuclear power can provide uh, a decarbonized electricity, of course, in uh, an abundant manner at a time where we're trying to electrify all sectors, like, for instance, mobility. Now, we've seen all these advantages that you've uh, told us about, but yet there are still yes. some problems with right. nuclear energy. Of course. Nuclear power is, for instance, considered very water-consuming. At the same time, it has a low impact in terms of land use. One of the main problems also is that it takes time to deploy. You have to construct the entire power plant, which takes time. And they tend to fall behind schedule. The reason why is because more and more you have these very stringent regulations, especially in the wake of 9-11 that actually happened. It's very expensive also to build those power plants. And this is the reason why many countries like France are now looking to what we call small modular reactors. These are tiny uh, little uh, power plants that are going to work also as a complement of the large conventional reactors. They're going to be closer to the consumers, uh, so they're not as powerful, but uh, they're quicker to build, quicker to secure. And it's also opening up a new era for nuclear power, because it's not only going to create electricity, it could also soon create heat. And that's a huge deal when it comes to industrial use that is now uh, uh, creating heat with gas. Uh, it can also produce fresh water through desalinization plants and perhaps decarbonize hydrogen. For now, they're not yet on the market, but they're moving very fast. And one of the problems that we've seen in that industry is because of, you know, this, uh, this rejection that we saw in the beginning of the 80s, there hasn't been any investment in those nucle this nuclear industry for decades. And this is something that uh, those countries has ca have called for as well at COP28. And there's uh, also the, the question of uh, the radioactive waste. We're looking long term, the security of uh, nuclear plants, and how do you manage that waste? Of course. Forward? So, the security issue, it's a huge issue. I mean, uh, you have to see there's security concerns when it comes to incidents, but also malicious acts. When it comes to uh, management waste, so just to give you an idea, following recycling uh, operations, you're going to have 96% of uh, used nuclear fuel that can be reproduced. We're going to see it. Uh, in, in just a minute. So 96% of used nuclear fuel that can be reused to produce new fuel to then, again, produce electricity. But you're also left with 4% of high-level radioactive waste, which is huge. So the way we dispose of that is that it's vitrified, and then it's sent underground for storage. So this is actually a safe way to do it, but it's not a long-term solution. So we still have to uh, work on that. The industry has to work on that. Uh, I think what's important here is to understand that nuclear power is a very 
complex uh, topic. It's sometimes frightening for people. Uh, but it's for the first time we're seeing at COP28 that leaders are talking about it openly and saying we can't reach net carbon uh, carbon zero for, t uh, for 2050 if we don't invest a little bit more on nuclear energy. It's all about a little bit of a balancing act when it comes to a nuclear exactly. energy. Exactly. And also realizing that when things go wrong on the international scene, unfortunately, many countries tend to have to revert to dirty fuels. Thanks a lot, Julia Seeger, with our science segment. And that wraps it up for this hour of Life from Paris, but I'll be back in after just a quick break.